Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, we have the honor of welcoming Mabel O. Wilson to with us for the J. Robert F. Swanson Lecture. And I'll just introduce the Swanson Lecture a little bit first and then introduce Mabel. Uh, the Swanson Lecture Fund at the Cranbrook Academy was established in 1983 by the family of J. Robert F. Swanson, a noted architect who was also the son-in-law of Eliel Sarnin. Each year, the Swanson Lecture Fund supports lectures by architects, designers, artists, or scholars who have received critical acclaim for their work and have sustained a record of excellence and achievement in their respective field. The Swanson family has quite a distinguished history at Cranbrook, and I'm honored to recognize two members who made this important lecture series possible. Architect Robert Swanson is a life governor of the Cranbrook Academy of Art, and he is the architect of the Salle Auditorium, where this lecture typically would have been held, but now we're having it on Zoom. Bob's daughter, Karen, Eliel Sarnin's great-granddaughter, is also an architect in the area, and is current governor on the Academy's Board of Governors. We are all truly grateful to the Swanson family for their generosity over the years, and for helping us to preserve the legacy of J. Robert F. Swanson and enhance the future through lectures like the one that we'll have this evening. It really makes it possible to have such amazing people join us. So thank you to Robert and Karen and the family for supporting this still. Mabel O. Wilson is the Nancy and George Rupp Professor of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University. She's also a professor in African American and African Diasporic Studies is the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies and co-directs the Global Africa Lab all at Columbia University. Mabel Wilson is trained in architecture and American studies, two fields that inform her scholarship, curatorial projects, artworks, and design projects. Through her transdisciplinary practice studio and, Wilson makes visible, legible, visible and legible the ways that anti-Black racism shapes the built environment along with the ways that blackness creates spaces of imagination, refusal, and desire. This practice, <clears throat> Studio And, has been a competition finalist for several important cultural institutions, including Lower Manhattan's African Burial Ground Memorial and the Smithsonian's National Museum for African American History and Culture. She is a member of the architectural team designing the Memorial to Enslaved African American Laborers at the University of Virginia. Exhibitions of her work have been featured at the Venice Biennale, Art Institute of Chicago, Architecture Museum at TU, Berlin, TU Munich, Istanbul Design Biennial, Wexner Center for the Arts, and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum's Triennial, as well as the Storefront for Art and Architecture and SF Camera Works. She is also a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, YBYA, question mark, an advocacy project to educate the architectural profession about the problems of globalization and labor. She is the author of several books, the most recent being the first ever volume on race and modern architecture, which we have been reading this semester. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Mabel. Mabel, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all um, for coming uh, today. Hopefully you can hear me and you may hear the sounds of New York City outside my window. I'm in my office, which is on Riverside. Uh, so occasionally there's loud music since it's a warm day. But I just want to say I am speaking on the traditional land and unceded territory of the Munsee Lenape. I pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, present, and future presence of the Lenape on their homeland. Uh, I also wanted to thank um, Gretchen uh, 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 for the gracious invitation to give the Swanson Lecture uh, and also for the invitation to share my work with the, the Cranbrook community. And thank you, Mike, for keeping all of this going. Um, so uh, let me get started. So I'm going to actually talk about um, practice, um, the kind of practice of Studio N, which includes that scholarly work. And I often don't really talk about all of the kind of other making material stuff that I do in relationship to that, which is really what comprises Studio And, which I began in 2007. And I chose the ampersand as a sign that my practice was both collaborative, as in um, other people, as well as transdisciplinary, as in other and other disciplines. So this diagram that I'm showing here indicates that this practice um, has navigated between written works, which you see on the left, um, architectural projects and installations, which you see uh, on the, the right, installations, performances, and curatorial 
practices. Um, this was an early diagram of my practice, and it illustrates how critical research finds expression in one form that often leads to a parallel project in another creative modality. Um, and so I wanted to share why it was important for me to even develop this way of working um, over, the, over the years, particularly to situate race and blackness in the built environment. So during my architectural education in both the um, undergraduate and graduate uh, levels, I have a um, BS in architecture from the University of Virginia and an MARC from Columbia. I recognize that in order to draw blackness into architectural discourse and to make visible anti-black racism in the built realm, that I needed to transgress the boundaries of the discipline of architecture. And I turned elsewhere to art, to critical race theory, to black studies, to poetry, to lit literature. And early on, I think a critical intervention for me and a method came from the work of Toni Morrison, who provided critical methods and deep theoretical frameworks um, for my practice. And so to sort of rephrase Morrison from her essay, Black Matters, my effort to manipulate architecture was not to take standard architecture and use vernacular to decorate or paint it over, but to carve away its accretions of deceit, blindness, ignorance, paralysis, and sheer malevolence so that certain kinds of perceptions were not only available, but were inevitable. In Morrison's work, like playing in the dark, whiteness and the literary imagination, I began to understand that it was important to reckon with the ways in which the Western episteme and the ontological framework of whiteness has made it provisional, if not impossible, for the African, along with the African blackened in the hold of the slave ship to become Negro, to attain a historical consciousness. The subject formation, and that is the self-determined, self-conscious, self-possessed um, that the West imagines as being modern, blackness is consigned to the past, to the primitive, to the savage, to the not modern. But blackness is still wholly necessary, as Morrison writes, to give definition and depth to whiteness. That relegation to being on the threshold of being modern awaiting development is, as many have written, a misreading of what it is to be and, and what it means to be modern. Poet Nurbasi Phillips, like Morrison, recognizes the trap of the West discourses. She distrusts language, the language of documents, of policies, the language of being in history that can't account for the Zong incident, when enslaved people were thrown overboard and the, ensla the slavers attempted to collect payment for the lost cargo. The humans turned into property on the ledgers. Philip writes, quote, the language in which these events took place promulgated the non-being of African peoples. And I distrust its order, which hides disorder, its logic hiding the illogic and its rationality, which is simultaneously irrational." End quote. So what is modern architecture if not dedicated to order, logic, and irrationality? But it can also be hiding the disorder, illogic, and irrational, irrationality that is the double bind of modernity, as we see in this early public repainting, Republic painting of liberty and slavery by Samuel Jennings. The discourse of architecture, its representational schools, tools, its historiography, its dependency with state power and racial capitalism, its aesthetics and technologies are knotted in this double bind of racialized thinking, representation, and practices. So this is an image I'm using actually for my scholarship, which shows liberty freeing the slaves, the ordered world of architecture, and the enslaved not yet in that organized realm, but in nature, right? And they're essentially waiting to return to Africa, right, now that they have been emancipated. But liberty is, you know, she, 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 she gazes over the, the world of, 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 of heraldry and cartography and music and painting, right? And so blackness is outside of that frame. So in response, over the past 30 years, I've engaged in a black study, 
one that allows me to see my own history being and, and bring black cultural practices and sensibility into the making of the built world. The studio is a place of study. And in that sense, my practice has been what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney and the undercommons have called fugitive planning and black study. Study doesn't engage, in, doesn't engage what is known, but rather it, it is a speculative practice, one that allies with liberation as a spatial practice, a belief that one of my collaborators, Mario Gooden, forges in his own work. Studio AND has been dedicated to making spaces of collaboration, connection, and exchange through the bonds of kinship, love, and mutual support. This is the ethos that frames my practice as I've explored the themes of home places, rememory, and mobility. Um, and I'm using Carrie Mae Weems here uh, in the ways in which she engages these institutions of the West, such as the museum. And I'm actually working on an essay on Weems. So again, it's something that I'm, I'm sort of thinking through. It's work I'm thinking through. Home places. In my last studio, um, in my graduate education at GSAP at Columbia, it's called Studio Six, still is called Studio Six. Um, my professor, Stan Allen, who went on to become a dean, the dean of Princeton, asked us to unpack the single family American suburban house through techniques of collage. I chose to unpack the, late, the latent blackness and invisible forces of anti-black racism in the suburban house. Now, growing up in what Diane Harris calls a little white house, in coastal New Jersey, which is shown here in the 1960s. It was actually designed by my father um, for a Jewish builder who decided to build um, a community uh, for middle class Blacks. My entree into the world of language and ideas was through a book called Before We Read, whose pictures shown here not only reinforce gendered roles, but whose whiteness was, a, was normalized not by words, but by images. This common edition of the Dick and Jane Primer series reinforced that even before we read words, we decode the world through images. And clearly, neither words or images, as we see here, are neutral. So for the Studio Six project, I turned toward Toni Morrison's epigraph to her novel, The Bluest Eye where she carves away at this iconic Dick and Jane primer. So note how the first paragraph introduces the single family house of the suburb. Here is the house. It is green and white, right? It's generic colors, it's entrance, and the family that resides here. Notice how it teaches us to read through forms of identification, types of sociality, what is aesthetically pleasing and various forms of effective response, right? It makes learning to read possible. Now the second paragraph, Morrison removes the rules of grammar, right? The thing that structures the meaning is removed. So we can read words, but without the pauses of capitalization and punctuation. And as a consequence, meaning here becomes elusive. So here is the house, it is green and white, it has, you know, it just becomes, you know, this sort of endless cascade of words. Now in the third paragraph, Morrison carves away even more by removing the space between words. This string of letters makes the detection of words difficult and thus makes reading difficult and enunciation impossible. You can't inhabit the text. It invokes both the madness and the silence latent in the bluest eye. So in her novel, Morrison tells the story of a black girl, Pecola, who lives amidst the untold, untold violence and suf suffering. Pecola, however, believes that if she only had blue eyes, she would be beautiful and hence happy and safe. But in the book, we find it is exactly this third paragraph, insanity, that becomes her refuge. So for my project for Studio Six, the Levittown House became the site of operation. 
a long history of white settler colonialism, which forged whiteness as property, as legal scholar Cheryl Harris writes. Restrictive covenants and bank lending practices ensured that America's post-war finan federally financed suburbs stayed white and heteronormative. Why did you select Labertown to live? We were looking for a place to buy a home. We looked at Levittown, and we liked the homes here. We liked the advantages that Levittown seemed to offer in uh, comparison to other cities. And we understood that it was going to be all white. We were very happy to buy a home here. So looking at the plans and sections of a conventional Levittown house, this was the first model seen in, found in Long Island. I adapted Morrison's strategy of carving away to misread the spatial logics of the house through its own representational logic of drawing and the emplacement of other objects. The drawings dissected, uh, the dis dissected drawings, I dissected drawings to find hidden below the stairs, between the walls, inside the cabinets, around the pubbling, pub plumbing, under the floor, in the basement, inside the attic, representations of blackness, the mask and Jemima, the charms, and both have these sort of dual readings uh, in terms of what they are. Through this process that included reading the suburb and the city, where I also drew from suburban houses in the South Bronx uh, um, redevelopment project called Charlotte Gardens, I discovered what I called a house for a grigri a talisman, and that's shown here in these drawings, for domestic rituals and encounters with the everyday practices of Black life. Black artists have a long history of working with found objects, thinking here of Romare Bearden, for instance, and his collages. And I turned toward the assemblage art of Betty Saar, whose liberation of Aunt Jemima became a generative figure for the house for a Grigri. And I also drew on the familiar work of Los Angeles-based artist John, John Outerbridge, who recently passed away um, in November. John Outerbridge, who is my mother's brother, he's my uncle John, grew up in Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow South. Here is the house of my grandparents in Greenville, North Carolina. My mother and uncle grew up in a house nearby, but this is the home place that I remember as a child where I spent my summers. My mother migrated with my father to New Jersey in the 1950s, and shortly thereafter, my uncle John migrated to Chicago and then Los Angeles, as did many of their generation, fleeing the oppressive racism of Southern segregation at the turn of the civil rights movement. Now, along with their trek, they brought with them a rich culture of making things, making a way out of no way, right? And this is kind of what I remember growing up in that little white house in New Jersey. And so I've written, you know, the way to think about the home place is, quote, home places can travel like peoples and packages. Anywhere you collect objects of remembrance, model ships and family photographs, or practice rituals of everyday life, cook fried fish from old recipes or make live soap. All of these things serve as spiritual entrees back to one's home place. Now, my Uncle John eventually settled in Los Angeles in the 1960s and joined a cadre of artists that included Betty Saar and David Hammonds, Noah Purifoy, and others who made revolutionary artistic statements out of the detritus of the Watts Rebellion of 1965. John Outerbridge built full-scale installations that found beauty and blight. With architect photographer Peter Tolkien, I spent a day in the mid 90s talking with my Uncle John about how he not only made art out of everyday life, but also how architecture was very much a part of the language that he used. He was also a painter, a photographer, and a blues flautist. He found art in many things, including the culinary, and we shared the sweetness of grilled catfish while the soulful strains of John Coltrane drifted through his studio in South Central Los Angeles. And so that's why. The, the essay is called Catfish and Coltrane. And you can see my uncle on the right. A is for artist. The door on the right is for vintage VWs. The colors of blue, red, yellow mark hazardous chemicals for art making inside. 
doors with holes, artwork on white walls, windows framed by the aesthetics of urban blight, the fragments of rag on one side, on the other side, a towel bar, bar that carried the rags for watching, washing dishes. Screws as buttons on In Search of the Missing Mule from 1993. And in his kitchen, screws mark an asymmetric rhythm connecting two countertops as part of everyday life. My Uncle Johnny's studio was deep deep space like Sun Ra. And I think that links very much to the creative legacy that he's left behind to his family and to his artistic community. So over the long arc of the Great Migration, thousands of Black Americans like my parents and my Uncle John moved to and transformed the places to which they had arrived. As Farrah Griffin writes in a poignant exploration of migration narratives, who set you flowing, quote, after leaving the South, the next pivotal mo moment in the migration narrative is the initial confrontation with the urban landscape. The confrontation with the urban landscape usually experienced as a change in time and space, technology, as well as a different concept of race relations results in a profound change in the way the mechanisms of power work in the city. So in 1995, with Farah's work in mind, um, uh, I started a, a project um, uh, uh, with um, Paul Cario, who became my partner in a practice called KWA. And the exploration of familial histories of migration was one of the things that we worked on. So for several years, this project, The Way Station, was a full-scale uh, installation that examined the architectural spaces of urban migration. And we were interested in how migration as a force doesn't alter urban space in immediately apparent ways. Instead, these transformations occur in much more subtle ways over time and within the confines of, the domest of domestic space. So we wanted to chart how these communities appear and disappear and thus fail to maybe register as legible urban traces. And so on the right, on the left, you can see our plans for like a kitchen, a bedroom, a living room, and a bathroom. And then on the right, the away station sort of collapses all of those spaces in the same location, and then basically cut them apart, section them apart. And so you get the door next to a shirt or, um, uh, uh, the television next to the crib. Um, and so there's a kind of density of domestic activities in a very limited space. So in these interim homes, these way stations, people establish domiciles that are situated between the memories of the homelands from which they may have fled uh, or, or moved from and the imaginings and the desires of the places they aspire to be. Sometimes these homes are a hotel room, the residence of a family or friends. In the most dire, it could be a refugee center. But it is nonetheless a point of transition before the return to their homeland or a point of transition along a path of adaptation to a new place. And so the sense of sort of the, the ways in which, you know, things are sort of packed into this temporary space of in-betweenness. So the way station borrowing the language from assemblage art, collapses these spaces into amalgam of objects bought in transition, like furniture and clothing, as well as sentimental objects um, and newly acquired objects of consumer culture. And so these are pictures of the fabrication. Paul is in the white shirt working. Uh, and we collaborated with a really um, great uh, architect, Yusuke Abuche, who now is teaching at the University of Tokyo. He ran uh, the AA's design research lab for a number of years. And this is a sense of that final construction. Um, uh, these are, are objects are sort of packed into a dense space in which the rituals of everyday life unfold. So the sectional cut through a chair, through a phone. Um, and, you know, the first place that we um, showed it was the storefront for art and architecture in New York. These are actually 
photographs um, by Peter Tolkien. Uh, and the away station's 15 towers can be unpacked according to the spaces that they inhabit um, and can adapt like the migrant to unpredictable circumstances of the site. So here's another sense and you start to see different uh, pieces that look familiar, um, but that are also unfamiliar, sort of like the psychological space of someone who is in transition. So as you walk through, you hear narratives of, of migration. So for New York, we interviewed two Haitians, Jerry and Jean Uric, who tell different stories at different times of one in the 60s, one in the 70s of, of leaving uh, Haiti and the wrath of the Duvaliers. We spoke with Ellen, who is an undocumented Filipino woman and her aspirations. And we also spoke with my father, who talked about why he left the South uh, in search of opportunities for his family up north to only meet with like um, segregation in work in you know private workspaces and also in the attempt to even buy a home up north. In San Francisco, a Colombian woman who migrated for Peru told us about trying to seek independence for herself and her family. We interviewed an elderly Chinese American man who left his homeland at age four. I think he was 95 when the time we we talk with him and he was uh, he moved to, to San Francisco in 1915 and in Los Angeles we interviewed my uncle John about his journey westward from North Carolina to to Los Angeles so in terms of architectural representation the away station somewhere between model somewhere between drawing somewhere between full-scale thing unpacked the architectural and psychological realm of home places Rememory. Now my colleague, Saidia Hartman, has written the following. I want to tell a story about two girls capable of retrieving what may, remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present, without committing further violence in my own act of narration. It is a story predicated upon impossibility, listening for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, and refashioning disfigured lives and intent on achieving an impossible goal, redressing the violence that produced numbers, ciphers, and fragments of discourse, which is as close as we come to a biography of the captive and the enslaved. And so she reminds us to think about how do we build places for remembering the past from archives and sites of slavery, which still bears the traces of the physical, epistemic, and ontological violence of enslavement. So when I was in um, finishing up my uh, master's at Columbia, the African burial ground was uncovered in lower Manhattan. And it was so-called rediscovered as a 17th and 18th century slave cemetery, which dates back to the Dutch, primarily um, burials were under the British, and it was located out of what was then Manhattan's defensive walls. We have to remember that in that period, New York at that time was one of the largest slaveholding regions in the British colonies. The archaeological study revealed um, that ritual of burial still reflected diverse African cultures. They discovered that bodies were buried with head, their heads facing east. They found cowrie shells and pins that, uh, you know, sort of a flash of the spirit to usher the dead into the next life. Of the larger area that they, they think was the original um, cemetery, only a fragment was uh, extant in the 90s. The cemetery remained invisible, und undisturbed itself, because it was buried under 25 feet of earth until it was discovered when the federal government was digging foundations for a very large office building. And that's what you see on the right. A divisive battle ensued between coalitions of community groups and politicians and the government service administration to halt the removal of all of the remains. The goal was to remove all the site for study, but once all of the remains were removed, the site would be ahistorical and they could complete the construction of the building. That did not happen. There was a competition 
And Paul Carrick and I were finalists um, to build a memorial on the site of the African burial ground. In our project Sacred Ground, we sought to understand uh, the complexities of the life of the enslaved in New York City and to try to make visible and present this buried history by becoming a gathering space, a garden for the descendants, and I mean that in quotes because they don't know specifically who direct descendants are, but descendants who claim heritage uh, to and connection to the enslaved community that is here. And we say that they were descendants because there have been you know, practices and rituals occurring on the site even before a memorial was going to be placed there. We worked together with landscape architect uh, Walter Hood, and we imagined the site as a garden whose caretakers would tend the grounds of native and medicinal plants and thus tend to the memory of its a uh, African ancestors. We imagined this kind of fence of kind of figures that surrounded it sort of as witnesses. And in the middle would be this kind of circular gathering space for all sorts of ceremonies and prayers and, and rituals. Um, made of transparent and colored bricks of cast glass, the spirit catcher would be a sort of bridge, a gateway between the city and the sacred ground. The spirit catcher would mark a threshold between the descendants and their ancestors as they entered into the sacred ground of the memorial. The original burial of the dead um, in New York was often clandestine. Since the burial ground was outside the city wall, enslaved Africans were only given permission to bury the dead after dark. And so we wanted to fashion a space that recalled the bonfires that were lit to provide illumination at night and thus form a kind of interior enclosure, a space for communal bonding and a home for the living and the dead in New York City. But there are other histories that are invisible and that lay buried. As I mentioned, um, my I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, uh, Jefferson, you know, particularly if you study architecture, reigns king. It's Mr. Jefferson's university. And so when it opened in 1826, UVA's 10 pavilions, and you can see this on this cartouche, housed faculty and family. Its lawn rooms boarded 125 male students. Those are seen in the colonnade. Um, and the verdant swath of the lawn in the center, which was terraced, was crowned by the rotunda, the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library, right? I mean, this is, this is the ideal platonic sphere of knowledge, right, of, 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 of enlightenment knowledge. In his plans for the academical village, Thomas Jefferson, who was signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of Virginia, the third president of the U United States, plantation owner and owner of 600 enslaved men and women and children over the course in life, brought together at UVA an exclusive community and an environment he designed to be conducive to, quote, to health, to study, to manners, morals, and order, end quote. And again, order, right, logic, the rotunda reason. But what until recently remained silent in the official historical narrative, certainly we didn't hear much about it, although I knew about Sally Hemings and Monticello, was that from 1817 to 1865, there was, li there, there was little mention of the academical village's dependency on an equal number, roughly 150 at one time, enslaved men, women, and children. And we see here and if we, we go in into the detail of that cartouche, an enslaved woman taking care of the white child of one of the professors. And that history lay hidden in plain sight for 155 years. In 2007, UVA's Board of Visitors authorized the installation of this plaque um, on, the, on the ground of a walkway in front of the rotunda co-equal with the recognition that they gave to white craftsmen and builders who worked on the construction of the university. And yet this plaque had unintended consequences of sparking student rage and outrage to say this was not enough to honor the enslaved people who not only built but maintained UVA. 
the, uh, the hidden history became even more tangible to the black community when archaeologists discovered 70 unmarked graves behind the university's official, university's official cemetery. And seen here is a memorialization uh, uh, that began in the community and ended at the cemetery to recognize those lives. And so the students launched a competition, the memorial to enslaved laborers, and the university earnestly undertook an effort and set up a commission to study the history of slavery at the university. And so in 2016, I joined with architects Mijin Yoon on the left, who's now the dean at um, Cornell, Eric Howler um, of Howler and Yoon, our activist and conflict mediator Frank Dukes on the right and landscape architect Greg Bleem to win the competition to design the memorial to enslaved laborers at UVA. On the, on the uh, other, the image um, with Frank, you see artist Eto Otatigbe who joined us in the process. And so the left image um, shows some of the things that we were looking at and thinking through people like Fred Wilson, the famous image of, of, of Gordon who had been enslaved and beaten, you know, the, the, the scarring of the physical body, the violence of slavery, the brooks as the space of, of enslavement and a range of things that we were trying to think about and look at um, around, um, you know, like a, a kind of language of representation to draw from. So, but before we even had that charrette on the left, we spent a fair amount of time with an intensive community engagement process. We spent about three months talking with people before we had that charrette and spent, um, you know, between um, October and June really going through an intensive engagement process um, before presentation to the Board of Trustees, the Board of Visitors. Um, we engage multiple stakeholders on their turf, going from classrooms at UVA with students and alumni to local community members at the Jefferson School's African American Heritage Center to local African American churches. Uh, we also went to presidential homes of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison's Montpelier to engage with members of the descendant communities um, of those great homes, and some of whom were actually uh, uh, connected to the descendant community of the University of uh, Virginia. And from this, you know, we heard that the memorial needed to tell the unvarnished truth about the past to have legitimacy. Uh, it needed to bring the community together to learn and reflect on this difficult history. It needed to express dualities, not only pain and suffering, but also the resilience, dignity, and the humanity of those who were enslaved. And lastly, we heard that it needed to be a living memorial, an ongoing memorial to acknowledge that the work of this commemorative landscape remained incomplete, right? And that the afterlife of, of, of enslavement was still with us. And we, we heard that there had to be a kind of material presence. Um, you know, this was a quote about how I feel the internal pride of gazing upon every brick or pillar, you know, that the fraught path had birthed an undeniably beautiful present. And for that, there, there was a sense of kind of gratitude. So along with collecting aspirations and hearing about meanings and experiences and stories that needed to be told about the memorial, as part of our design process, we research black traditions and gathering spaces. Um, we looked for cultural forms and rituals that could be translated into design. Um, we looked at, for example, how people gathered in ring shouts, which is a low country ecstatic dance where people move in a circle whose rhythms and movement connect to West African practices. Um, circular forms um, like the ring shout became relevant the idea of a broken shackle. We looked at a painting of Al uh, Alma Thomas thinking about like gathering, right? She has this amazing painting of a circle with, with marks of gathering that we interpreted as gathering. Um, we heard at our meetings that the memorial had to forge a connection with the community. And so in response with careful study, we cited the memorial kind of on an edge of the university precinct on an area known as the Triangle of Grass, a threshold to the grounds just northeast of the rotunda. Um, and the memorial joins a local commemorative landscape um, whereby um, during the yearly Freedom and Liberation Day, which just recently happened on March 3rd, uh, that remembers the day that Union troops liberated 14,000 enslaved persons in Albemarle County, that the memorial would be a stopping place on that, um, on that march. Uh, 
And so you could see how the memorial is cited um, in dialogue with the rotunda. The rotunda sits at the highest point of the lawn, which Jefferson replaced on a ridge line. Um, and careful terracing of the lawn section allowed Jefferson to create the pavilions, the tin pavilions that were two story high on the lawn side that we saw in that perspective, but three stories on the garden side, which created a lower level walkout basement, which held spaces for the labor of the enslaved and in some instances where they, they lived. The spaces behind the pavilion were enclosed by the very famous serpentine walls where work yards, where people, enslaved people chopped wood, washed laundry, hauled water and slaughtered animals for smoke houses. So Jefferson understood that slavery was abhorrent and employed architecture, the architectural section to conceal it. So the memorial architecture, um, by contrast, works to reveal, to open, to invite. And so utilizing the landscape, we situated the memorial to sort of be like an open bowl-like figure in the landscape in contrast to the closed sphere of the rotunda, and yet both are 80 feet in diameter. So our memorial mimics the kind of geometry of, of um, the, the rotunda. So the memorial is north, oriented northward as acknowledging the direction of freedom and the path on the left lays out a step for each year 40 of the 45 years enslaved people were at the university. So you can see here how the conical intersection creates a series of nested rings that offer multiple layers that unfold the stories of the enslaved. The center holds a gathering space which is inscribed by an inner ring that holds a timeline by historical events. And then the next layer, um, the ring creates a concave surface of remembrance where you see the names and the memory marks. And then the outer convex surface serves as a canvas for expressions, the, the representation of pain and also the eyes of, of Isabella Gibbons. So to develop this sort of layered history of the memorial, um, we worked very closely with a group of committed historians and whose thoughtful examination of UVA's enslaved community and the history of slavery there provided rich material. To name names, to tell the story of the enslaved community required that we engage with an archive of work ledgers as seen here, extra hands at Christmas, uh, paid $2.50 to their owners. We also engaged the personal letters of slave owners. And as such, it is an archive of daily life, one laced with silence and violence. Now we should say that the university rented the majority of workers to build the university and to take care of the grounds. They only owned, I think they estimate like two to three enslaved people. However, the professors owned slaves who cleaned, cooked and took care of their families. This enslaved group also maintained the classrooms where the students learned and the hotel owners where the students ate also owned enslaved people who cooked, served, and cared for and cleaned the student rooms. So the historians that we worked with estimated that about 5,000 men, women, and children built, labored, and lived at UEA from 1817 to 1865, but we know very little about their lives. Um, and so we recognize that 4,000 in an array of memory marks across the inner arc of the memorial. And so for most 3,111 persons to be exact, the archives do not record a first name or a last name. And so they are represented by the memory marks. And as a spreadsheet on the right shows, we found records for about 889 persons. Of those references on the right, we only know mostly the first name of 577 and only a handful of people like Isabella Gibbons, Sally Cottrell, Henry Martin, we know a first name and a last name. But for the remaining 311 recorded people, we use kinship relationships and occupations to remember their lives. So as you walk in, you become enveloped by the sort of genealogical clouds of marks, of names, and of relationships. The list of names and dates, traditional features,
Sorry, it seems we have lost Mabel. Just give us one second and we'll see where she went. Hold on. Mabel, are you there? Yeah, I don't know what happened. I'm actually uh, in my office, so I have a stable connection. I don't know. It just you you just disappeared. I thought maybe your computer lost power or something, but yeah. you're back. So yeah, no, not at all. That was very weird. That was weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah weird. But I'm glad you're back. So it's windy here. I thought maybe it was the wind or something. Yeah. Yeah. No. So was I on the names of the wall? The wall. Is yeah. Yeah. I think it was. Okay. That perfect. Line. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it cut off, and so at least I knew. Yeah. To okay. um, to check out. So all right. Let's get back to it. Right. All right. Let's see if I can get back into full screen. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thanks. So, <laughs> so as I was saying, the traditional idea of having names and dates, right? Dick, we couldn't do that because we couldn't get the history. And so uh, we had to reimagine social relations and rehumanize the experience of the slave. And so as a result, seen here, visitors engage Henry, um, Isabella Gibbons, Jane, Jack, Robert, and Randall. But we see them as families of sisters and grandmothers, uncles and friends, as workers who took pride in their work as, as woodcutters, as janitors, as laundresses, and as fiddlers. And so carved into the granite are also 4,000 memory marks that speak back, sometimes with tears, to their descendants and to us. And so the tactility of the granite draws us to it to touch and be touched. And since um, the memorial opened, um, there have been other names that have come through, come forward. And so um, uh, the um, names have actually been, um, new names have actually been etched um, onto the, the memory marks. So the names of the um, uh, uh, of the enslaved are across from a bench and uh, a timeline with the water features that carry, ca um, captures the attentions of visitors who can find a very different history of the university. So in contrast to the wall and the marks, which rises uh, and inclines outward as you come in, a shallow, very near level water table shares with visitors the history of enslavement at the university. And you can see that people sort of just lean in to sort of read, read that history. There are 70 entries. They're inscribed into the water table and they begin with the arrival of enslaved Africans to Virginia in 1619. And it ends with the passing of Isabella Gibbons in 1890. It covers the arrival of 10 enslaved workers that came to clear the land with Jefferson in 1817. And it covers a history of transactions, work, and violence. In reference to libation rituals of West Africa and Christian rit rituals of, of burial um, and the currents of rivers that carried people to freedom, a steady stream of shallow water washes over the entire arc of the timeline. Isabella Gibbons, who was a teacher and founder of the Freedman School, which became the Jefferson School, where we actually had meetings in Charlottesville, um, She's also the only member of the enslaved community that, that archives have yielded a full name, first and last name, a date of death, a photograph, and a brief written uh, uh, description, a record of her experience. And she serves as witness for community. This is what she remembers. Quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breasts as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not, or ever will." End quote. And so this appears at the end of the timeline. So um, 
Eto, uh, the artist on our design team, became interested in layering the information we had gleaned from our conversations and the historic sites and the archives, such as this rare photo of um, Isabella Gibbons, um, uh, to think about um, the, the kind of exterior surface. Um, uh, we, you know, kind of became interested, like the rough tombstone of the daughter of Zion, which is an African American burial ground in Char Charlottesville, and you know the the ways in which the vertical quarry marks of stones being removed, um, uh, and the ways in which it was worked by skilled masons. So we're looking at a close-up of the photograph of Isabella Gibbons' eyes. The original Im image actually is in the archive of the Boston Library. And why this is, is because she was enslaved at UVA by Barton, uh, William Barton Rogers, who was a mathematician, a mathematics professor, who would move to Boston and go on to found MIT. So to realize this image in stone, and the stone um, is, is actually um, Virginia mist granite, which is quarried in nearby Culpeper, and it's a, it's a stone that's actually found at the rotunda. The team had to develop a very unique process and customize software. Um, uh, we needed to translate a very data intense, uh, the data intensity from the photograph of Isabella Gibbons' eyes into a virtual model. And this was a technique that Eto had developed in his art practice. Um, and so uh, we were able to kind of work with Quara Stone in Madison to develop a technique to actually translate this to a much larger scale in a very different material, such as the granite. So then we generated um, a, a machine tool path to create a virtual surface that was overlaid onto a digital model of the memorial's curved surface. All of this took place digitally and working with remote teams before you know, the process of cutting into the stone panels. So there we see a section of this memorial surface engraved with an image of Isabella Gibbons' eyes. It's a lenticular image. So sometimes you see the bush hammering and these kind of markings that are sort of, you know, one reminiscence of the labor of, of, of working granite, but also the markings of, of you know, of Gordon's um, back of the violence of, of slavery. Um, but the image of, of, of uh, uh, Gibbon's eyes are also symbolic of those who were enslaved and their descendants who witnessed this change and hopefully a positive change um, for the black community of Charlottesville and the US. And so our engagement with this continues to make this a living memorial. Um, as construction began, UVA hired a genealogist, Shelley Murphy on the right, to really trace the descendants of the enslaved who names had been discovered by the historians and inscribed upon the wall. And here uh, on the middle and the left, um, in the middle is Detisa Gathers and on the left is Colleen Yate, both who are local activists and leaders in the descendant community of UVA. Colleen is also a member of the descendant community of Monticello, um, Jefferson's home. The memorial's reflective and inscribed surfaces, paths, and gathering spaces commemorate a community of Black men, women, and children who lived lives, who worked, who played, who weep, died, escaped, resisted, and in refused enslavement together. And we remembered their suffering, their dignity, and their freedom. But another group that also remembered this was the protest that happened days after the construction fence on the site was removed. The protest was organized by the medical school's White Coats for Black Lives. The group took a knee for eight minutes and 40 seconds in remembrance of the murder of George Floyd. A gruesome reminder that the violence and injustices persist in the wake of slavery. The memorial at UVA to enslaved laborers came through to fruition through a collective desire to face the past, to reckon with the truth including the horrible cruelties as the Gibbons quote on the timeline describes. With Isabella Gibbons as witness for and the watcher of her community, the memorial brings together their lives known and unknown to ours. Mobility. So for a number of years, I've been interested in this sort of question of movement, migration, as I spoke of with uh, the work of the away station um, and um, migration, uh, migration and mobility. And for Toni Morrison, she writes that it's not really technology that is the hallmark of modernity, modernity but 
migration and the transatlantic slave trade commencing one of the largest and longest forced migrations in human history whose trails are still followed today by the circuits of global trade. So in a photo and video project with architect photographer Peter Tolkien, we wanted to examine African modernism. Um, uh, what curator Okwi and Weezer uh, argues um, a, a, a sense of modernity that is accomplished in a very uh, different manner. And, and um, Okwi wrote, to begin with, modernism is not, this modernism is not founded on an ideology of the universal, nor is it based on the recognition and assimilation of an autonomous European modernism or on the continuity of the epistemic field art of artistic territorialization achieved and consecrated by the colonial project, end quote. And so with that, and thinking about that, um, we embarked on a project in Ghana to sort of look at what is modernism, uh, particularly initially first in the architectural. And so we decided to take up that, that uh, question. And here, we, this is uh, an image of the exhibition in our Studio X space in New York. This was a conversation with my colleague, Felicity Scott, and the uh, art historian, architectural historian, I Ikem Okoye. And so you could see some of the grids of the photographs and our, our videos on the right. And the, the, the exhibition actually continues on, a, on another wall. And so it raised many questions about you know, how African was the architecture that we found, the so-called modernism, um, because many of it were designed by non ghanaians people from Australia, the UK, from Lebanon. And what were the stories of modernity to be, be learned from not only looking at their work, but their context from the markets, from the, the histories of migrations of people like Du Bois, who, who dies in Accra. Um, were these stories of other modernisms to be heard? And so as outsiders, we sort of asked ourselves, what if we listened instead? And so here, this grid depicts two single family residents. The upper part is a residence from a prominent businessman. Um, and his house was built in 1962 by the architects Nixon and Boris. And the architect, uh, the owner, Mr. Peppera, who we met, was very gracious and took us to meet one of the architects that still um, practice um, in Accra. He was British, but he had been basically living in Ghana since that period. Uh, at the bottom are two uh, photographs of the private residence of an Australian architect, Kenneth Scott, uh, and his wife seen on the right, uh, a former Ghanaian diplomat um, who was then at the time a judge. This was the American embassy. It had been decommissioned and modified. Uh, it was by our, the architect Harry Weiss, uh, done in 1956. Um, and um, it uh, now housed um, the Ministry of Women and Children's Affair of the Ghanaian government. It's interesting, it's built up on piloti. It's very open at the bottom. There's a pool in the middle. And it represents, um, uh, uh, um, it's open to visitors and symbolic of a post-war approach to American diplomacy um, undertaken amidst the recalibration of old empires. So post-colonial um, moment. However, as we know, by the mid 1960s, American involvement in places like the Congo at the behest of corporate interests would be responsible for the downfall of first, these first democratically elected regimes around the continent. And in 50 short years, the US's architectural approach um, as its current uh, uh, embassy in uh, Accra showed us uh, was like a fortress. Um, and it went from communication to one of disconnect and control. This group, which was the last in the show, was a kind of cross section through time and space on the left uh, was a um, Pimpre College, which was designed by uh, Fry, Drew, and Associates from 1955 to 54, designed to educate boys, but now is a school um, uh, for boys and girls, kind of reflective of programmatic resilience. In the middle is a slave dungeon, Elmina Castle, on the Gold Coast, one of the slave forts. Um, and here is a Ghanaian tourist obs observing the, the interior. And my colleague, Saidiya Hartman, eloquently articulates in Lose Your Mother, you know, 
she says it's 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 a journey um, where nobody really has time for these old narratives because perhaps it's impossible as an African in America to return home because time has irrevocably transformed both worlds. And on the right, our last photograph shows MTN branch office in the busy district of Osu in Accra. And on every corner of all of the towns that we visited were peppered with cellular communication networks and brightly colored kiosks, vending phone cards. This emerging architecture of the street signifies a kind of new infrastructure whose architecture is that of a global aesthetic that implants itself in any city um, where high modernism and the international style is recalibrated. Um, and so I wanted to share a video about movement, about mobility taken in Kumasi on the streets of Kumasi. So we listened and heard many stories, um, perhaps many different modernisms in Ghana and other modernisms in Africa. So I'm gonna talk about an exhibition, um, African Mobilities that um, I contributed with as part of Global Africa Lab. Um, and in Paul Maxipa, who's a colleague and interlocutor so that the exhibition explores how freedom remains a scarce and unequally distributed commodity and how the freedom to move is increasingly becoming a principal stratifier in the long durée of modernity, coloniality, and neoliberal capitalism. Uh, Mario and I uh, started Global Africa Lab in 2012. Um, it's a kind of pedagogical project um, where, um, uh, uh, and a research um, where we teach um, workshops and studios sort of exploring um, uh, uh, urbanization technologies, both on the African continent as well as in the African diaspora. Uh, as part of um, the um, exhibition, African Mobilities, all of the participants had to organize a workshop and we did one here with students at GSAP, um, at Columbia and students from around the New York City area. We also did an exchange, uh, as part of the exchange, we did a public conversation uh, at Gavin Brown's Enterprise in Harlem. Uh, you see the Black Chalk Collective, um, uh, the artist, American artist, and Justin Moore. Um, and so we sort of talked about the themes of immobility and the question for us of the Afro-imaginary. These are some images from the exhibit, and I apologize, there is a group of um, motorcycles going by my window. Um, so a sense of, you know, the kinds of work that's in the show, we did a double channel video and on the right is work from Lake Jeifus and Wale Bria, we, uh, Le Wal, uh on Lagos. So our site was um, actually in the diaspora in New York City. And I'm just going to show a short clip of um, the video that we produced. <laughs> 
And so it's really a meditation on mobility and blackness in America and what that means. And on the left, you know, is a kind of narrative of the, the, the idea of the freeway um, and the impact of the construction of freeways on American cities, specifically black neighborhoods and urban renewal. And then on the right is a more contemporary one, you know, about the attempt, you know, of, of the ways in which black lives are taken in public space um, and the ways in which Black Lives Matters protests then take over streets, take over the arteries um, of exactly, you know, the, 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 the constructions that you see on the left. So, um, so thinking about this question of, of mobility and immobility. And so I'm going to see if I can skip just ahead. If I can, I don't think I can skip in the video. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna, but that, I think that gives you a sense. And both sides, they're sort of mapping. So we're mapping the construction of freeways around New York City and then Black Lives Matter movements in the 2014 after Eric Garner's murder. And the same way they're taking things like the West Side Highway um, that you know, were cut through um, working class neighborhoods. So I wanted to talk, talk a little bit about, again, another project about mobility. This was a project commissioned by Storefront and Art for Art and Architecture in 2017. Um, uh, and I worked with um, uh, an architect and colleague, Brian E. Roberts, uh, to research the history of marching uh, and black communities. And we collaborated with a really great um, drum and dance line, the Marching Cobras, which are Harlem based drum line and dance team um, um, who um, sort of work through the choreography of historically black colleges alongside the beats of um, hip hop and choreography of hip hop. We did workshops with them and it was important for us to talk about the history of marching connected um, to protest, um, uh, to the, the ability to claim public space in subversive ways and also in powerful ways. Um, and then we collaborated <coughs> with the Cobras to develop um, a performance piece. And I'll show you a small clip from that. One of the things we showed them was this is the silent march in 1917 against lynching and um, against um, uh, 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 a riot in St. Louis. Um, and it was organized by W.B. Du Bois. The women and children all wore white and they marched silently down Fifth Avenue. Um, thousands of, of black New Yorkers. And then on the right are the uh, Harlem Hellfighters who had their own um, glorious parade celebrating their return after fighting with the French, not the Americans, uh, in Europe um, during World War I. And this group was a very talented group of um, musicians who really brought jazz to, um, uh, to, to Europe. You know, um, and, and talking about, you know, in New York, how people took to the streets like Marcus Garvey, you know, to, to parade for black nationalism or the civil rights protests in New York. So that marching and taking to the streets had different valences. We also just showed them the sort of history of dress and costume and flair and fashion. These are a, a, a dance line, a, a, a marching group. Um, uh, from the Cobras in the 70s and the HBCUs with their uniforms and capes. We worked with the Cobras um, for several months. Uh, we chose Marcus Garvey Park that has its own fascinating history. So we learned what they did. They learned, you know, through us, their histories. And, and so we really collaborated with um, the group on uh, peace, the peace marching on. Um, here's Bryony um, um, taking Nigel's measurements. He carries the big drum um, and um, we gave them all capes um, to kind of signify, you know, that history of kind of marching in HBCUs um, and the capes. You could see the dancers wore all white, um, the drummers wore um, the, the kind of olive uniform of the Harlem Hellfighters, the white signifying the silent march. Um, and we presented marching on in Marcus Garvey Park in November 17th in partnership with the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance, as well as part of Performa 17, which is a biannual sort of uh, performance event um, that's been, been going on for a number of years and draws um, performance artists actually from around the, the world, artists and performance artists from around the world. 
And Marcus Garvey had its own history. Um, it has a drum circle that's been a long-standing institution on Saturdays. Anyone can join. But as you can see on the right, you know, as the neighborhood gentrifies, there started to be noise complaints about the drumming, um, and, you know, which is also a way of sort of shutting down, you know, um, people of color often, um, um, uh, 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 you know, who've been in the neighborhoods for, for generations that then are kind of forced to not, not only not, you know, engage in, in sort of public acts, but also to move because rents get, are, are, are raised. Um, and so we had um, two days where we made a lot of noise in the park. Um, and I'll show you just a short clip to get a sense of what we did. So you get a sense of the choreography goes from these very kind of linear formations of drill, drill movements, which they hadn't really done before, which was very new for them, to mixing it with their choreography. And so they flip the, you know, they flip the cape to their colors, which are also loosely based on the kind of markings on the pavement. Um, and, and so they were really amazing to work with. They, they perform, you know, uh, actually now internationally, they're in the movie Birdman. They had just done a, um, uh, uh, a fashion show with Rihanna. They've done recently Pyre Moss's show. Uh, and then you can often just find them, you know, performing on 125th Street. Um, so it's very much, you know, sort of engaging in these collaborations and performing, you know, is, is kind of what the, the, the group really dedicates to. So we also did an exhibit that included um, Jenna Heiselman's amazing portraits of the group um, and then used the fabric as a way of sort of organizing that gallery space, that kind of triangular space um, of storefront um, uh, uh, in, lower, in lower Manhattan. Um, and then uh, lastly, yep, yeah, we did a performance. Um, uh, the group, when the show opens, came and, you know, we had a hundred spectators and we did so again without a legal permit because the same problems of you know people having you know music or noise you know the gentrification sort of brings with it these a kind of resistance to these sounds but i would just say we marched on black and proud so i just wanted to talk a little bit about uh most recent uh project i've collaborated with um uh, I co-curated an exhibition with Sean Anderson, co-curated with Ariel Dion Krosnick and Anna Burkhardt. Um, um, and uh, this is a, uh, just a view of the field guide that we made about the show. Um, it opened uh, uh, two weeks ago at Museum of Modern Art. Um, and we wanted to sort of think about architecture, blackness in America. 
um, to think about the legacy of slavery um, in the built environment that one can see in redlining maps like this one in Queens in the 1930s, the red being you know, the, the, the areas that are graded D, which are poor, often with black people living in them, but you could be Chinese, Mexican, depending or immigrants, depending on where you were in, in the country. Um, and the impoverished produced by that imprint of economic and political collusion in real estate can then be seen in the overlay of a COVID map, right, that, that, that um, Studio Anne developed for the field guide. Um, so you could see, you know, again, like the, these, you know, the, the, the legacy of things like redlining are producing, you know, concentrations of, of poverty that then, you know, um, make populations vulnerable to, to COVID. You know, and in the midst, you know, to think about the, in the midst of the degradation of white supremacy, black people nonetheless found spaces of beauty, dignity, and joy. And so Reconstructions is an exhibition of 11 architects, design, designers, and artists who create diverse projects exploring blackness, the legacy of anti-black racism in cities and towns across the US. And this, this map that I'm showing here shows the, the various projects like Walter Hood's in Oakland, uh, Amanda Williams is in Kenlock, Missouri, uh, Yolanda Daniels is in LA, the artist David Hart, we commissioned a specific work for both the book and for the, the show. And this is with the all black towns that emerged um, after reconstruction around the country. Um, we asked the group to consider the scales of the body, the porch, the street, spaces of beauty, knowledge, liberation, violence, play. And then there were 10 sites, 10 cities, um, New York, New Orleans, LA, Pittsburgh, Nashville, um, Oakland, um, St. Louis, which became Kinlock, um, Atlanta, and Miami. And here's what has emerged. country. It's been a real challenge because black people in America are not given the space to even just be. In order then to think about possible futures, somehow we have to reimagine ourselves in new places and then find ways to get there. We're not just interrogating America's history with blackness. We're interrogating architecture's history with blackness. All right. And so this just gives you a sense of what's there. This is Mario Gooden's uh, protest machine. It's about the protests in, in Nashville. Um, here's uh, Yolanda Daniels in the background with her sort of layered black city, Los Angeles. Um, uh, we see in the center, Lake Jifus and his sort of project about a kind of dystopic um, future Crown Heights, Brooklyn, New York. Um, uh, Sekou Cook to the right and his stoop um, in, in Syracuse. Uh, Felicia Davis on, um, and, and her kind of responsive digital textile fabrication. Um, here's a closer view of the, the, the project about Syracuse, about public housing. And to the left is Jermaine Barnes's spectrum of blackness around Miami and his deconstructed um, uh, uh, spice racks. So both of these projects are around about the intimacy of domesticity. And the Black Reconstruction Collective created a powerful 10 by 10 manifesting statement that commits to quote, continuing this work of reconstruction in black America, which is to hang, hangs outside the gallery and creates a new threshold um, to the galleries and to the exhibition. There's a really great article that was published this afternoon by Michael Kimmelman, actually on the Black uh, Reconstruction Collective in the New York Times. And though we couldn't have an official opening People were none that less out. Blackness was out, fierce um, and beautiful. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. That was incredible. I was just amazed at so, there's just so many ideas and so many amazing projects um, going through my mind. I, we are lucky enough to have Mabel joining us, uh, myself and the architecture students just now following this lecture for a discussion of her work and her writing.
Um, and given that it's 624, I think we'll move straight into that space instead of having questions here. So um, if you have burning questions, you can always get in touch with me and we can pass those along. But otherwise, uh, we will conclude the public talk tonight here. Um, and just want to say again, thank you so much, Mabel, for such an amazing talk and for joining us. Um, thanks everyone who has joined us too for the for this lecture. And thanks again to the Swanson Fund for allowing us to bring people like Mabel to Cranbrook. Thank you. Thank you.